Welcome, Randy Kay here, and I am very excited about this program we have for you today. My friend, Pastor Alan DiDio, pastor of The Encounter in Charlotte, host of Encounter Today. He is one that wrote a book that I am just mesmerized by. This is my second reading of it. You can see it there, Summoning the Demon. We're going to be talking today about Nephilim, UFOs, end times, artificial intelligence, all of these things that maybe some might think are off limits for, for Christians we're going to be talking about. So, Pastor Alan DiDio, it's great to have be with you to be with you today. See, I'm already struggling with my words. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be with you. So excited to have someone like you who's brave enough to talk about the subject matter because it's been taboo in the body of Christ for such a long time. Oh, we're not used to taboo subjects and talking about <laughs> no. after death uh, experiences. So, <laughs> so we're right in the zone. We're prepped uh, to hear about what you have to say. Now, since this is touching on some areas that uh, maybe were previously thought about as off limits, uh, how did you come to write this book? Well, that's one of the primary reasons, because those who were addressing the issue, as far as I was concerned, was take it into fringe, far extremes. And it's very easy for people to get detached from the Word of God when kind of drifting off into these theories. And I wanted to explore this myself as, as kind of a skeptic and see what does the Bible actually say about AI, aliens, the Antichrist. And it really started with me watching a clip of Elon Musk, who was asked about artificial intelligence, and he said, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. And in the, he compared it to a movie where this guy draws a pentagram and he's going to summon a demon thinking he can control it. And he said, it doesn't work out really well for that guy. And he said, that is the threat of artificial intelligence, that we are conjuring something that we're not going to be able to control. And I thought the urgency of the church understanding this as well as its place in Bible prophecy was so important, I began to put pen to paper, and then as I dove deeper, I saw its connection with aliens and, of course, with the overarching agenda of the spirit of Antichrist in the earth today. Yeah, you use the term technological singularity, and that's a new term, was for me, a new term. But explain that to us as to what that means and how we may be on the path to not being able to control this technology. Yeah, this is so important. The technological singularity is a phrase that's used to describe when we enter into artificial general intelligence or what most people think of when they think of AI developing consciousness. Now, the reason why it's called the singularity, this, this is often a phrase that's used in reference to black holes. When you cross the threshold of a black hole, it is believed that we enter into a realm with a, where our Newtonian understanding of physics breaks down. One plus one is, does not equal two any longer when you cross the threshold. So what it means is we can no longer predict with certainty what is going to happen after we cross that threshold. And it is believed with artificial intelligence that we will reach artificial general intelligence, some form of consciousness, some say by 2045, some say 2030, some say in the next 18 months. But they say that once we do cross that threshold, there is no way to predict the impact on society that it's going to have. And the church needs to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Yeah, we we seem to be headed down that road. And you bring up in the book the possibility that the Antichrist could not do what uh, Scripture tells us he will do without the help of artificial intelligence. Explain that a little bit. Well, when we read in Revelation chapter 13, we see a, an entity, a personality, a character, the Antichrist, the prince that shall come, as Daniel refers to him. And he's able to control the world's economy, and no one is able to buy or sell except they take the mark of the beast. Now, we often think of that in many different terms, but if you think of it practically speaking, how is someone able to control what people are buying and selling on the other side of the planet? Until recently, that's really not a possibility. But now with artificial intelligence, a very small group of people in one room could literally control the global econ economy, who can buy and who can sell. And this is growing and developing. This is part of the concern of AI. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a, the kind of guy who says, 
we need to run from AI, get your pitchforks, and we need to abandon it. We can talk about that here in a moment. But we do need to understand the threats that we're facing and how the church can be involved in providing an answer to those things. And that's why I I like how you piece all of these different uh, elements together. That is technology, UFOs. You talk about the Nephilim, which I'm going to ask you about because that's in the Bible. Uh, and all of these different aspects that have been studied. And now we seem to have this heightened interest in UFOs. Are they real? How does that fit into scripture? Should we be talking about that? Is there some demonic influence around that? And you, you begin to weave together a narrative within the Bible as it relates to the Nephilim. And mm. I don't know if many understand what the Nephilim are about. And it was this commingling of uh, the angels and the humans, but explain how that kind of ties into this supernatural aspect of what's going on today. Yeah, I never, I never wanted to be the alien guy, by the way. Never wanted to be <laughs> that person who's bringing up that subject matter. But when the Department of Defense is discussing it, when there are congressional hearings where actually in the book I have word-for-word -word, uh, testimony from congressional hearings as well as previously classified documents from Project Blue Book and, and other covert intelligence operations showing what the government has been doing behind the scenes. So when new whistleblower laws were enacted, it was safe for people to come out and begin to share about what they experienced in highly classified situations. That's the reason why lately we've seen this explosion of whistleblowers and eyewitness testimony like David Grush, who says we do have um, uh, vehicles of non-human origin and things like that. So the moment it went into the mainstream and you could see, I don't know if you've seen this, Randy, but people kind of gravitating toward this. Uh, so quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is because there's no accountability. Mm -hmm. If you look at the rise, there is a rise right now of alien religions. And it's I believe it's going to explode as people kind of begin to worship these entities beyond the stars. And particularly with atheism, if you look at Richard Dawkins, the author of The God Delusion, who's the poster child of intellectualism, mm -hmm. he says that he believes it's certainly possible that aliens seeded life here on this earth. So seeing that, that helped me say, okay, it's safe to talk about this. Not only is it safe, we need to talk about it because it's an apologetic that we need to answer. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to give people biblical responses to this. So the question that arises, are what we're seeing, is it is it kind of a psychological operation? Are these actual um, supernatural, non-human origin vehicles or beings, or is it all just a hoax? And the answer to that question is yes to all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, there are certainly hoaxes and I've, I've been in some recent sermons kind of debunking, uh, some of the recent alien videos and things that are coming out. You know, you saw the thing in Miami and, and that's kind of how they petty fog the issue by putting in a bunch of fake hoaxes, mm -hmm. but there is something real going on. And what I, the case that I make in the book, as I dove into this again, kind of as a skeptic, if you're familiar with X-Files, there's the Mulder and the Scully. And I kind of approach this as the Scully. As I dive into this to investigate it, I realize this goes way, 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 way back to the book of Genesis, as you mentioned, where the sons of God and the daughters of men get together and create this race of giants. Then we have this uh, Tower of Babel with Nimrod that is an antichrist type and shadow, and it all ties in together, and we're now seeing that system resurface. That's why I think it's so important for Christians to understand this that this is part of the Antichrist agenda. The Nephilim, these, all these alien, even the hoaxes, it's all part of his strategy to deceive people in the end. Yeah. Well, I like that you bring up that if we don't take on the subject, that others will adopt this and it will become the common narrative. Yeah. And that's something that we've struggled with within the near-death experience uh, world or uh, milieu is that that narrative had been stolen for many, many years by those who are not of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what you're talking about here. So when the common question is asked uh, as to whether these UFO sightings are real or not real, um, should we be, and I was asked the question the other day, uh, do you believe in uh, aliens on another planet, for example? Mm. How would you suggest that we respond to that uh, question? It's interesting now more Americans believe in aliens than believe in God. This is why this is such a 
a startling statistic to realize that in the United mm. States of America, land of the free, home of the brave, in God we trust, more believe in alien life forms than believe in God. And so um, the question is asked all the time, and it's time for pulpits to begin to answer this question. And I remember Lester Summerall, one of the great generals of the faith, uh, had a whole series called Alien Entities where he dove into this a little bit. And what we're seeing with the shift in language in the news gives us a little piece of information. David Grush and others in these congressional hearings are no longer saying extraterrestrial. They're saying non-human origin. Some are even beginning to say interdimensional. And when we're talking about extraterrestrials, in other words, entities, life forms living on another planet, an actual planet, actual civilizations, plural, out there, there's certainly no evidence of that. We really don't have much evidence of things entering our atmosphere, but we do have evidence of aircraft that defy all laws of physics uh, in our own atmosphere, coming out of the ocean, uh, around volcanoes, around nuclear test sites. Uh, what are these things? Well, I think the Bible makes a very interesting case when we see Elijah being caught up in a whirlwind. A chariot of fire comes down and picks up Elijah and takes him out of here. Some sort of some sort of spiritual vehicle that Elijah could only describe as a chariot of fire. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that we see angels riding chariots. Why do angels need a vehicle to ride in? Mm-hmm. That's that's a fascinating question to me. And again, I'm approaching this as a as a skeptic, but I'm looking at the biblical evidence now. Uh, Luis Elizondo, who was the former leader of the UAP Task Force, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, in the Department of Defense, he recently did an interview, and I cite this in the book, where he was talking to someone higher up in classification in the Department of Defense as he's doing these re- this research into UFOs. And the gentleman with a higher classification said, you need to stop. He said, what are you talking about? He said, you need to stop digging further because it's not what you think it is. We know what it is, and it's not safe. And he said, have you read your Bible lately? And Luis and Elizondo have been kind of shocked, saying, well, what are you saying? He says, if you've read your Bible, then you know exactly what we're dealing with, and you need to stop investigating this. Hmm. Signifying that in high levels of intelligence, they are recognizing that this is not an extraterrestrial encounter. This is an interdimensional demonic entity that people are encountering. And as I've talked about this, Randy, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well uh, in in your area of expertise, I never realized until I released the book, so many people have come to me and said, I've had an experience, I was attacked, or, you know, the list goes on and on, had a close encounter, if you will. Strong ministers of the gospel, people everyone would know, People from all across denominations are saying, I've had some sort of experience, some sort of encounter. Thank you for giving voice to this. So the answer is, is it extraterrestrial? There's no evidence of that. Are they interdimensional beings? I think that's perfectly biblical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think think that, you know, when we talk about having an open mind, obviously we don't have an open mind to the point where everything spills out. You know, we want to be qualify that against the word of God. Uh, And you talk about uh, Project Blue Beam. And the potential for society uh, in these last days to gravitate towards a narrative that would detract from God, uh, the God of Jesus Christ, and bring the focus somewhere else. You use the example of Orson Welles back Mm -hmm. in the uh, time of the radio days, and there was the War of the Worlds, and he was reading from that. And people were listening to it, and they adopted that as truth. Uh, yes. It was fiction, and he had to apologize for that. But you you talk about in the book how that could be a possibility that the, a false narrative could be created that would lead those uh, away from the Lord and to some other uh, belief or even some other experience that is not of God. Yeah, this was one of the most fascinating chapters for me, Project Blue Beam. I don't know another preacher's book that has a has a uh, chapter on Project Blue Beam <laughs> all by itself. Not Blue Book. There's another chapter on Project Blue Book in my in my book, but Blue Beam, this conspiracy theory, which which dives into what you're what, what you're touching on, is so important. Even if the whole alien, interdimensional, non-human thing isn't real, it is the agenda of many in power to create a false narrative, a great end-time deception, if you will, that will fool the masses into believing that there is a threat of extraterrestrial life, and the only way to counter it 
is for us to come together in a one world government, one world economic system. Now, there was a Canadian in the 90s, I go into detail in the book, who suggests that there will be that globalists will use modern technology in order to create an Armageddon-like event or an alien invasion that will cause people to rally under a one world leader. Now, he was, interestingly enough, arrested, and the day after he was arrested and released, he mysteriously died of a heart attack. Fascinating. you got to get the book to get into the details of, of Project Bluebeam. But if Orson Welles could cause hysteria on a radio program to get people to react and think the world was ending, that we were being invaded, what can they do with the technology we have today, with artificial intelligence? There was a gentleman recently, a Belgian man, he died after committing suicide after speaking with an AI, just talking with the AI, and the AI convinced him that he was contributing, if I'm not mistaken, to global warming and that it would just be better for him and for the world if he were gone. And he ended his life as a result. Mm. That's just one individual. What's going to happen when this explodes? This technology is ramping up faster than we could possibly imagine, and we better be ready for it. Yeah. I'm fascinated by that uh, for the, you referenced the, the mysterious death of this individual who had been studying this and how they're seeing, you know, it's not necessarily an inference that there's some degree of cover up, but there right. could be, you have, you pose a lot of questions for us to consider and pray about uh, as to what, what is going on. Because even as recently, as you note in the book in 2023, there was an investigation, a congressional investigation in ufos they were called unknown uh aerial phenomena uh uap as you note in the book so there's even a different term now that's being referenced for that and so that has taken a center stage not just in the past in the 60s and i remember outer limits and all of those programs yes, from yes. you know we have to be wary of uh, of the invasion that uh, could potentially occur but even today we have now this topic, uh, you know, top of mind. So when you consider that as a Christian body, when we're presented with this, how should we respond? What should we do in these last days to counter this move of the, or this fixation, if you will, on, on, on uh, UFOs, and even, uh, you know, there's a discussion I'll ask you about Nephilim in further detail. How should we respond and counter that, spiritually speaking? Well, the Bible says God was speaking to his people. Don't call a conspiracy what they call a conspiracy. And what he, what he was saying with that is, don't approach these conspiracies with the same fear that the world approaches them. They approach it and they get fearful, thinking there's nothing we can do. A conspiracy theory is a good way to become a victim because there are powers greater than me somewhere I can't see, I can't find, then there's nothing I can do about it. That's what I want to pull people out of in this book. And I, and I hope with it, I, I raise all these radical questions of what people are talking about, but I bring it to an answer and to a, a biblical basis that across denominations, everyone can say, amen, yes, in Jesus' name, that's a proper response. So number one, don't grit, don't, don't drift over into these conspiracies and think there is no hope. There is hope. No conspiracy formed against you can prosper. <laughs> and every tongue that rises will will prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, God will condemn. We need to recognize greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So yes, there are nefarious characters out there, but you have a greater one living on the inside of you. And this is the evangelistic moment of the season. I'm telling you, the world is interested in this. If you'll just get a little bit of knowledge on it, and begin. We have to, as a church, stop sloughing this off, laughing at it. We have to give an answer for it. It's a fascinating subject matter. It's fun to talk about, and it's a way to get people saved. Yeah. You know, I was having a discussion, and this was with a Christian leader who would be recognizable. I won't mention this person's name, of course, who had asked me point blank after I shared my, uh, my uh, afterlife experience if I believed in these things. And then somebody else who had been on the program that I had suggested to them um, had said, yes, I believe that there are there is life on other planets. So I, to your point, we need to be have a response because I said to her, no, 
No, let's let's think of it more as the spiritual realm, more the demonic realm. And speaking of the demonic realm, um, I'm going back to the Nephilim now because there's been a lot of teaching around the Nephilim. I don't know that it's widely understood uh, who the Nephilim was, but you actually, in your book, reference the potential uh, vis-a-vis scripture of the Nephilim being somewhat resurrected or appearing in the last days. Yes. Yeah, it's really interesting. And Nephilim can refer to something um, even beyond what we discussed earlier, the sons of God and the daughters of men coming together. Nephilim can simply refer to a hybrid of human and demonic either entities or technology which is something I go in when I compare the Tower of Babel and artificial intelligence in the book. But what's really interesting is when you get in the book of Daniel chapter 2, there's this vision, and we see we see in the vision this um, mud mixed with iron. And it's it, and some have wondered, is that going to be artificial intelligence? Is that is that transhumanism? People have wondered about that. But then when we get to Revelation chapter number 13, it talks about this automaton, that the Antichrist that the Antichrist creates, so it certainly could uh, be some sort of merging of man and machine. But here's what it's, Daniel predicted. He said that when the Antichrist comes, what, what's going to happen is that the enemy, Satan, will mix his seed once again with the daughters of men. I believe it's Daniel 2.43, if I'm not mistaken. People can look that up. And again, we go into detail in the book that will there be a rise of Nephilim? Where the where Will these demonic entities or angels once again merge with humans? Or will it be demonically inspired technology that fuses with humanity, that transforms who we are, our consciousness, and what we're capable of, even our will? Will it override our will? Neuralink just, just released uh, a report that they successfully implanted into someone's mind a chip so that they could control a mouse on a screen with their mind. Now, how far is that going to go, and will it change who we are as individuals? Would that be a form of Nephilim? I recently did an interview with uh, L.A. Marzulli, and he talks about, um, and I go through a little bit of this in the book, but he goes into more detail, the different types of Nephilim in the Old Testament. Not all of them were giants. Some of them were, were different entirely. So there's a different impartation from demonic entities into human nature, into humans' lives, that creates something different and something evil and corrupted. And could that happen in the last days? I think there's no question about it. I think we're already seeing it. I think the Antichrist is already waiting in the wings. I believe he's been waiting in the wings for every generation. I think Satan has always had an Antichrist ready. Mm -hmm. And I think this generation is no different. Yes. Well, you know, the, um, the, the temptation is to look in all different directions for these things. And you mentioned this earlier that we should uh, center our not only attention, prayer life, and focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and have no fear. But you alluded to and you wrote about in the book uh, the Tower of Babel and the analogous times that we're in today with artificial intelligence and almost almost looking at it as a parallel in some sense in that uh, many people have looked at the pyramids, for example, the Tower of Babel, they were trying to reach into heaven, and uh, God had destroyed that. And you, you, you talk about some parallels there that may relate uh, to the technological realm that we're in now in aspiring to reach heaven to a godlike state of some sort. So tell us about that, how we can correlate kind of what we're, what's happening today with what happened during the time of uh, building the Tower of Babel. Yeah, Nimrod is one of is the second antichrist-like figure that I see in Scripture, and it is believed from some um, extra biblical sources that he was a transhuman, that through some sort of uh, demonic technology, and this is this is these are ancient writings, through demonic technology he became this man hunter. This he was a cannibal as well as a hunter of men, and he was feared of all people. And there was some sort of supernatural crazy technology that was being used. Because the Bible said they were trying to build a tower to heaven, Babel. Of course, Babel means gateway. So the question is, were they building actually into the atmosphere to go into outer space, or were they building something as an access portal or gateway for demonic entities? And then you compare that with CERN and some other experiments that are going on in America and around the world today. And so he's trying to accomplish this. And the Bible says, fascinatingly enough, they're trying to build a tower to heaven. 
They're going to be able to accomplish it because they're of one language and they're of one speech. So the Antichrist agenda is going to be able to be accomplished and advanced because everyone's saying the same thing. And what does God do? He comes down and confounds their speech, confounds their language, so that they're dispersed. They can't cooperate and work together any longer. Now, with artificial intelligence, I can take my phone. I can go to any nation of the world. I can talk. It'll translate, and they can speak, and it'll translate to me. Just really easy. I've done this. It's 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 so easy. It's scary. Is it possible that this technology is tearing down those barriers of separation that was hindering the Antichrist agenda, and we're seeing it happen right before our very eyes? Wow. That's, that's absolutely incredible. I have to ask you, Alan, are, am I talking to the real Alan, or is this AI? I'm not sure. But, you know, uh, actually, you know, we're looking at doing the audiobook, <laughs> and we were playing around with an AI um, system. I don't know what it's called where you just drop in an hour's worth of me speaking. And then it's supposed to spit out something that sounds like me. We did a test on it, Randy, and I could not tell if it was me or if it was the AI. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So the technology is here. But I'm not Max Headroom. This is the real beard, the real me. I'm here live and in person. <laughs> That's good to, good to hear. Putting it in context for yours truly. So I was recently, somebody reached out, and they said that a uh, library system had done a kind of a composite of what I was saying. And, and, and they, they noted some misstatements, not misstatements, actually outright lies that were infused into what I had said. So they were kind of bringing mm. that technology to distort what I had said. And I had to correct that and actually had some people help me going back to the source to uh, tell them to take it down. So that's, that's exactly fits into this. I mean, so what are the, what's the potential that we will have to discern in different ways how the truth is being conveyed? Because if technology is distorting the Bible, what you say, what I say, say and others, how can we be on guard and, and really make sure that the truth is indeed the truth, if that makes sense. It does. And this is going to be, this is going to be really challenging because we are, we are, we see a generation that is already losing touch with reality. Uh, I saw an interview with Keanu Reeves. Those of you watching may be familiar with a movie he did called the matrix mm -hmm. where this, this guy is kind of trapped in a virtual reality. And he said he was at someone's home and he was trying to explain to a 16 year old, who had never seen the movie. We've got this guy, he's trapped in this virtual reality, but he wants to know what is real. And the girl responded to him and said, well, why does he want it to be real? Why does he care if it's real? If it's, mm. why does he care? And he's, and he kind of pressed a few questions. He's like, so you don't care if it's real? No, why would I care if it's real? So mm. one of, one of the dangers that we are already seeing in this generation is that they're detached from reality and they don't care mm. as long as it feels good. And as long as it, uh, scratches whatever itch they have at the moment, they don't mind if it's really real. And what artificial intelligence is going to do, one of the interesting uh, questions that Elon Musk has posed is that, do you believe that we'll get to a place where video games are indistinguishable from reality? And the answer to that question is yes, we will get there. I mean, they're, they're crazy close now, but certainly in the next 20, 30 years, you can have a suit on, you'll be able to do, you'll be able to get in this game and you'll feel everything, sense everything. So you won't be able to discern what's real and what's fake. And then the follow-up question is, how do you know you're not in one of those right now? Mm. Wow. And, and the gener this generation kind of bites on that. And they think that's super deep and, and they're fascinated with it. We need to let people know there's there's a truth out there. This is what it's all leading to, because if nothing's real, nothing is true. There is a truth out there. There's a reality out there, no matter how you feel, no matter what you think on the inside, that does not separate you from having to stand before God and give an account for what you did with the truth that you've been given. And so everyone is rushing toward AI. Everyone is rushing toward aliens because there's no accountability. There's no truth. Everyone can do what is right in their own eyes. We have to give an answer to these things, and we have to bring the truth before people so their conscience can be pricked and so that they can give their lives to Jesus. Yes, because there seems to be uh, 
a programming that is anti-Christian in some in some programs. For example, when I was uh, I was uh, playing around with some AI, a, a popular program, and plugging in um, a question or not a question, actually it was more a joke. So I was testing it out. So I plugged in a joke about, uh, well, not a, not a, too disparaging, but I plugged in something about Jesus of a comical nature and it gave a laugh response. And I plugged in the same for Muhammad mm-hmm. and it gave me a lecture that there, you should not to be uh, disparaging <laughs> other religions. So there was a built-in bias. You could, yes. you could joke about Jesus, but you can't joke about these other uh, religious figures. This is why I say we, we need to dominate the AI world as long as we possibly can, because we need some Holy Ghost filled fire baptized believers at open AI at Google who will drop in subtly gospel algorithms, the Roman road, and so that people can get truth through these systems, as well as the fact that a lot of these programs are being open sourced uh, so that we can have access to them. We can create gospel algorithms. We can create gospel AIs that never sleep and that do nothing but answer questions about Jesus and call people to meet him and give their lives to him. These are things that we should be doing. We can't do what we did, the body of Christ did when the radio came out and say that's of the devil and that the world dominated. We can't do what we did when television came out and they said, see those antennae and see that cord on the back. Those are the horns and that's the tail. That's the devil. We need to stay away from that television, internet, uh, streaming, social media, the church has been behind the eight ball. We must do what mm-hmm. we can while we can to advance the gospel through it. And as you said, be aware of these biases that are programmed within them. Yes. Well, you know, one of the, uh, when I've, when I've read books before about, uh, these subjects, I felt kind of a little, uh, dirty in a way. I mean, dirty in the sense that I felt the eeweegebies or something like that. I didn't like it, but I read this and I feel like I've been edified, you Uh know? So the difference between this and maybe getting into a book where you, somebody writes about uh, some of these various subjects is that you're always coming back to what the response that we should have to these. You're not necessarily answering all of the questions, although you do, answer some of the questions uh, very nicely and and with substantiated information. But it's the way that you surmise all of this. So my question to you, uh, Alan, before I'm going to ask you to pray for our audience, is what is the takeaway that you want the readers to have after they've gone through summoning the demon? Well, the takeaway is you're going to feel like more than a conqueror by the time you're done. The last two chapters are my favorite two chapters. And all of this stuff may seem like ethereal and separate and uh, have no association with practical day-to-day life. Those last two chapters bring it home and show you how, yeah, what you're battling with is connected to the Antichrist spirit. But 1 John chapter 4, how many of you watching online have ever heard that verse? I'd be interested in the comments. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. We hear that verse, it's on t-shirts, it's it's, you know, graphic designs all over the place on social media. Did you know that that verse is specifically talking about the Antichrist spirit? Mm. Greater is he that is in you than the Antichrist spirit Mm. that is in the world. So the alien agenda, AI, all the things that the Antichrist spirit are using. And it's interesting to me, AI is often a kind of a faux gifts of the spirit. It promises all these things, the gifts of the spirit promise us. And so what I want you to know is no matter how much power the enemy seems to have, there's no reason to cower in fear. Like the children of Israel, when they were faced with David, and they cowered in fear for many of them. It's the first time faced with the revelation of, of, an, of a Nephilim, of a giant. And they didn't know what to do with that. Supernatural opposition, they didn't know how to respond to it. But David did. Something rose up within him. And I want this book to cause something to rise up within every single person who reads it to say, I've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. I was built for the battle. I was created for the conflict, and I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So when you read this book, what I want is I want you to walk away with hope, knowing there's still power in the name of Jesus. Mm, I love that. I love that. Yeah, and I love that you bring up uh, David and, you know, Goliath and, you know, the Nephilim, the giants of uh, this age and how we should not be fearful, but actually take them on. Uh, with uh, the full faith and uh, under the guidance and power of uh, the Holy Spirit. I love that. Um, 
so uh, before I turn this, all of the guests that I have, I ask to pray, but you are a mighty prayer warrior, my brother. And so I'm going to ask you to pray for our audience. But before I do, I have to ask you where uh, people can get this amazing book. And I highly recommend you order it. I'm oh, breaking it off from the screen right now. So we'll put it. <laughs> I was practicing this before. I love this book. <laughs> I love this book. It's something I think you, so and I know you need to read uh, because it's going to prepare you for these days. And if we're not prepared, we're going to succumb to uh, what the enemy throws at us. So where can yes. we get it? Well, you can go to summoningthedemon.com or blame it on the Nephilim.com, which we just had fun with that URL. Blame it on the Nephilim, because no matter what's going on in the world, Randy, you can always blame it on the Nephilim. Blame it on the Nephilim.com. And of course, you can always go to EncounterToday.com, but uh, SummoningTheDemon.com is, is the best way to get there. <laughs> I love it. The Nephilim, yeah. And, and and you said that they're not necessarily all giants, or they weren't all giants, uh, potentially, but... Uh, so yes. that uh, so we need to watch for every height and uh, configuration mm -hmm. that they might come in. But yes. uh, anyway, so now I have the pleasure and honor to turn this over to you, Pastor mm -hmm. Allen, to, if you will, be kind enough to uh, pray for our audience. Yes. Hallelujah. Father, I pray right now. I come against every anxiety, every bit of depression, every bit of hopelessness. We break its power in the name of Jesus. Lord, your word says one can chase a thousand, but two can put 10,000 to flight. We stand in agreement now, and we speak victory over every yes. household represented watching this video yes. right now. We declare you will not grow weary, and you will not be wearied by the Antichrist's agenda, but greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Lord, let the greater one rise up on the inside of them. I pray that every Bible verse they've ever read, they've ever yes. heard, every hymn they've ever sung would be like a seed throughout their entire life, yes. that in this season would grow up to a hundredfold return and that they would see the miraculous power of God at work in their family, at work in their minds, in their bodies, and every area of their life. I pray now the peace that passes all understanding would rest on them and that they would be the great end time warriors you've called them to be. Yes. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Now, I know people are going to want to uh, discover more about uh, Encounter Today, and you also have uh, recordings of your preaching at the Encounter. Uh, so tell, tell us how we can uh, see more of you in, in your programs and your teachings. We have all of our resources from our podcast to our uh, YouTube, our, our church services, all of our interviews that we do, especially with wonderful people like Randy Kay at EncounterToday.com. That's EncounterToday.com. And, Brother Randy, we've launched a news site so that people can get end-time news that matters to you at, at EncounterNews.com. And they can check out news every day. We have new articles every single day um, throughout the day. So you can check back again and again and again, and there's always something new to show you what's going on and give you a solution, what you can do about it. Wonderful. Well, you can see the links on your screen, but also in the body of this message, we'll give that to you. I encourage you to go back and see the amazing programs that uh, that Pastor Allen has uh, presented. They're absolutely phenomenal. We were talking about uh, AI and praying against any, any interference, and for the first time, I left my phone on. Maybe the editor has uh, taken that out, and then my shirt is not <laughs> normally this way. So we've already had technological glitches. You know, but uh, so I thank you so much uh, for being with us today, Alan. And, and this is Such an amazing pleasure. book. Got to go get it and uh, be well prepared for uh, for this day and age. It's my honor. Thank you. All right. So I have some great news for you. If you have prayed and believed in your heart that what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you, that he sacrificed himself for you. And what you need to do is to ask forgiveness of him. We've all sinned and you need to do that sincerely because he took himself to the cross. That's right, he sacrificed himself. He could have called legions of angels to save him, but he did not. But he took on, on the sins of those who confess him as their Lord and Savior and confess their sins in asking forgiveness. 
So if you have done that, and even if you haven't, if you do it now, and uh, you ask him to become Lord of your life, I have some great news for you. That is, be of good cheer, because heaven is in your future. Take care, and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.